Hi everyone, welcome to this last video of this uh, lecture series. In this video we'll discuss several ways in which you could make your research work more transparent and we will discuss uh, why you should strive to make your research work more transparent. So some options you could consider to make your research more transparent are to do with making parts of your research publicly available such as the pre-registration of your research plans, which uh, Neve discussed in her video, making your work openly accessible, which means that people don't have to pay for your, uh, re to read your research, and making your data openly accessible for other researchers to use as well. And if you do any of these things, you could earn some of these cool badges that you see here on the right. Um, but before you do uh, any of these things, please discuss this with your supervisor first, because um, it involves making part of your parts of your research publicly available, so they should be happy with that too before you go ahead with that. Um, but most importantly, to um, try and be transparent in your work, you should honestly record and present your steps and outcomes as you go through your research. Uh, why should you do this? Making your research more transparent will make it become more credible as well, and it's not just a good thing for your research, but it also reflects well on you and your professional image. And the uh, scientific community can really benefit from uh, having transparent and credible research edits to the knowledge base, because then you can, you can learn from it and build upon your research. Um, unfortunately, this isn't always the standard in science. As you may remember from the first um, video in which Alex has uh, referred to this uh, problem where a lot of the results in scientific studies and particularly psychology studies cannot be replicated. So that makes you wonder what the level of transparency in the studies really was and how reproducible they were and how um, detailed the recipes described in their method sections were. And, yeah, what, what went wrong here, really? And there's a lot of uh, potential underlying underlying reasons and, and factors associated with that. And one of them is the file drawer problem, which refers to um, the problem that uh, publishers are often biased towards publishing significant findings, and that um, studies that have resulted in non-significant findings often end up in the file drawer rather than getting plopped rather than getting published. <clears throat> and so this creates a lot of pressure on uh, researchers to come up with significant findings, because um, if only the significant findings get published, and this is the only way for them to get publications, which means to uh, this is the only way for them to move forward in their careers, there's just a lot, yeah, a lot of pressure on the researchers to to find these significant findings and to not find non-significant findings. And of course, that um, yeah, makes it likely for people to um, manipulate the data or the research narrative in some way to make it so that their work becomes publishable. Um, and that's a real shame because yeah, it's actually harming the credibility of science. And uh, one way in which people might be tempted to do this is um, harking, uh, which is short for hypothesizing after the results are known. And you can see that depicted on the image here on the right, really. It's um, basically you would come up with a hypothesis or a research story that makes sense after you've seen the results and you present it as if this was the thing you were researching all along in your a priori hypothesis. So you're adapting the story to fit your results rather than interpreting the results in the context of your story. So you're doing things the wrong way around. Um, and that's a real problem. And you could yeah, question if in this way is science really helping us get closer to the truth? And also, um, can we do better than this? And I certainly believe that we can. Uh, one of the ways you could can uh, consider to make your research more transparent is something that Neve has extensively discussed in her video, is to make this a very detailed research plan. Um, she's of course mentioned um, a lot of benefits from making such a plan already, 
Yes. One additional benefit is that if you've uh, set out what you're going to do beforehand, you're much better able to um, resist these pulls and these pushes to manipulate your research in a way that harms its credibility. And um, yeah, it will just make you a stronger researcher, really. And you're, yeah, it's really, you're able to resist these influences more. So that's a very important benefit that's also, uh, that also comes from making a research list like this. And um, there's a couple of other things we'd like to uh, draw your attention to that could help you with making your research more transparent. So a couple of do's and don'ts. <clears throat> so when you've devised this research plan, this and you've made this detailed recipe, um, trust trust in it. Yeah, trust uh, that you've made the right decisions, or that you've made um, you've weighed your options, and that you've that you have a good plan, and use it as your framework and your guide uh, throughout your research. D uh, don't keep trying things until you get a significant result because yeah it's just a lot better to to rely on the plan that you've made beforehand and if you do make changes try and do so before the analysis phase it's really okay to make changes i mean you won't start out with a perfect plan right away um, but just try and do so before you get to the analysis phase and avoid doing so at the very last minute potentially even after seeing the results because even if you do so unconsciously, it's very likely that you'll, at least to some extent, get biased by these results. Um, so yeah, try and make them before you get to the analysis phase. And we've discussed this uh, extensively in the previous video, but it's important that you try to transparently record all the changes in your notebook and uh, report these where appropriate as well. And uh, yeah, please don't feel that you need to hide any changes you've made because you're maybe embarrassed about making some mistakes at the start. Um, it's really okay. You, you, you don't have to have that perfect recipe right away. Um, but just if you make any changes, just, just be transparent about why you made them uh, because it will yeah, help you to remember as well. And if you're asked about the, why you've made certain decisions, it's much better if you can provide a clear answer like that. So um, yeah, transparency again is key here. Um, this is something that Neve has touched upon in her video as well. Um, it's important to clearly indicate which of your hypotheses and analyses are confirmatory in nature and which ones are exploratory in nature. So just to repeat the difference between the two, confirmatory hypotheses are those um, specific testable hypotheses that Neve discussed also you should have in your research plan beforehand. And typically these hypotheses are based upon previous research uh, and or specific theories. Um, and you have a clear expectation of what should be the outcome of your hypotheses that is going to be tested, of course, um, based on this previous research and theory. Whereas the exploratory analysis are done, I mean, it's really in the name, to explore other options and to generate new hypotheses, which can be um, further explored in and further tested in follow-up research, in future research. So both are very important for the progression of science because you need to test your current ideas, but also come up with new ideas to test, of course. But it's important to make this distinction when you're reporting your outcomes um, to, again, to be clear about which ones were confirmatory and which ones are exploratory, because um, the language you use to describe these results is also different. So confirmatory, the results from confirmatory analysis would often um, be presented in more stronger conclusions and more decisive language. And the exploratory results or the, the results from the exploratory analysis would be presented more as more tentative conclusions and um, yeah, be described more, more cautiously um, and often connected to yeah, future research ideas. So um, for instance, if you decide to add on more analysis after seeing the results or some of the results, the, the additional analysis that you would do would um, typically be exploratory. 
And um, what you don't want to do is then add these uh, or take these these analyses and present them as if they were confirmatory and you were planning on doing those analyses all along and uh, changing your focus in your research according to it, because then you're harking, really. So I hope that makes sense. Um, then, uh, yeah, apply multiple comparison corrections uh, when applicable um, and don't ignore the family-wise family error rate. So again, Neve touched upon this as well in her video. And um, it's just important to be aware that the more analysis you do, the more likely it is that you get a false positive result. So um, if you decide to add on more analysis or if you were already doing multiple analysis in your original plan, just be transparent <clears throat> about this and um, about what kind of multiple comparison correction you use in your uh, research. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, we just advise you to keep things simple, really. Um, don't overcomplicate your analysis. You will just make your life more difficult. And you won't necessarily make your research better if you add more analyses. Um, it's also an unrealistic expectation that within one work of research or within one dissertation that I believe is even limited after 6,000 words or to 6,000 words, you, that you can explore all the possible explanations for a given phenomenon. It's, it's not possible and it's not even per se the right thing to do or the thing we strive for in a research work. So um, yeah, don't get sidetracked and just try to keep things simple, stick to your plan as much as you can and don't overcomplicate things. So. Those are the do's and don'ts for this video. And then we just have a couple of final comments as we're coming to the end of this video and the end of the series. Um, I can't emphasize this enough, but significant results are not better or more important than non-significant results. You need both to get closer to the truth. And um, remember the three T's, think before you do, trace your steps and be transparent. And also an important note is that when you're uh, trying to make your work more reproducible, um, don't think it's like an all or a non thing that you have to do everything and be perfect at it. Um, uh, because, you know, that will depend on each, uh, each situation, on uh, each individual, on each supervisor, on each project, what you can and cannot apply in your, uh, in that situation. So um, every, just focus on the little bits. And also there's no one size fits all solution. So um, just try and be aware of these principles and apply them where you can and just keep them in the back of your mind. Also when you're reading other research, you know, it's just good to be aware of these things and just every, every little bit helps. So um, yeah, that's something we'd like to just uh, for you to take away as well. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of this series. So we'd like to thank you very much for your your attention and sticking with it. And best of luck on your dissertations and your final year. Please feel free to reach out. Um, our emails are listed here. If you'd like to uh, follow our um, reproducibility sessions or, or co come along to the sessions, uh, maybe follow us on Twitter, and then you can see which session sessions are coming up. Um, they're on the on every third Friday of the month on different themes related to reproducibility. And I'd also uh, encourage you to have a look at the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative website. We work closely with them and we also have a blog on their website and it's another way to um, get some updates on the reproducibility movement and just kind of stay involved. And please feel free to come along to uh, live sessions that will be organized um, alongside these these lecture videos so for this series as well so again thanks a lot and see you hopefully in the future bye